Hi there, my name is Memo. This is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially, it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see somewhere behind me. It's tropical house plants. So, as some of you might have seen on my socials, very recently I went up to Leeds here in the UK, and I went to the Rare Plant Festival there. That. One of the partners, I don't know if they were the only organizers, was Grow Tropical, a local company to the area there, which was amazing. And the owner, Jacob, is one of the loveliest guys you will ever meet. But I was also invited to take part in a discussion panel. And I thought I would try something different for this video. And I've never done this before, so if it goes a bit sideways, apologies. It might also not happen, depending if I can figure out how to do it. So I hopefully I'm doing this as a YouTube premiere video. So I will be there at the time of its launch to have a conversation with all of you. And I thought instead of me just showing you a video of the entire kind of panel and discussion, and if you do want to see that both Good Growing and the Plant Haven, so Emma and Claire, respectively, have done videos that kind of go more into detail with that. I think they also showed some of the festival, so I don't want to rehash that. I want to try something different. If you do want to see that, I will link their videos down below in the description. Please do go and check them out. I thought they were great, and also it just good memories of the day that we all went to the plant festival, and it was a chance for all of us to geek out together, essentially. But yes, I thought I'll intersperse some clips of some of my answers, that was taken by somebody in the audience, so you can see what I answered around that point. But I thought, let's go through the questions together, and I would love to hear your opinions down in the comments below. Obviously, if you're not here for the premiere and you still want to give some of your answers down below, please do. I will number the questions on the screen as we go through them, so if you want to kind of put number one, this, number two, this, feel free to do that. But I thought, let's bring you all in on the panel. Let's let's have that discussion as a group. I know a lot of people that follow me, that have been following me for a while, that are subscribed to my channel, are very, very knowledgeable folk. So I'm sure a lot of you will have a lot of opinions. And just some ground rules for this. Be respectful of each other. We can have differing opinions, and that is entirely fine. It's what makes this world a wonderful place to live in. We don't all have to agree with each other. And it is more of a discussion, so please, please, please keep it civil. I don't usually do this, but if anybody gets really aggressive or really rude in some of the comments, I might be removing those comments just because let's keep this a happy, cheery place, please. So without further ado, let's move on to one of the first questions that was asked during the panel. So starting off quite simply with this one, who got into houseplants pre-pandemic and who got into houseplants post-pandemic, so post-March 2022? So my, my answer to this is, for me, it was pre-pandemic. I kind of seriously started getting back into houseplants, I want to say 2019, it might have even been 2018. and. The people that have been here for a while will also know that I have had houseplants in one form or another at a large scale, probably not as large as I do right now, but at a large scale for different chunks of my life. When I was very, very young, my mother had a lot of houseplants on the balcony in Cyprus. Not quite a tropical environment, but relatively warm environment. Those houseplants stayed on the balcony winter and summer, so that gives you an idea of the kind of temperatures there. And it was my kind of chore as a young kid to go and water all these houseplants. So I got into it quite young. But yes, more seriously to this level of kind of collection, definitely pre-pandemic for me. Question number two, what got you started in your journey with rare plants? Now, this was an interesting one. Again, this was really interesting to see on the panel 
what the other panelists were kind of talking. And actually, I don't know if I've mentioned this, the other panelist was Cheryl in Motion, which I will link down below as well on her Instagram. And it was Claire from the Plant Haven as well, and myself. And I'm pretty sure Jacob actually made some uh, answered some questions there. So I will also link Jacob from Grow Topicals down below. But this was an interesting one because we all, as I said, had differing opinions on this. And I will tell you mine. And by all means, at this point, please do share with everybody down below your kind of reasonings. So with me, it was very much a case of got into the kind of standard house plants that everybody gets into. I then started seeing some of these house plants that haven't been around for a very, very long time. So they not, might not be as robust. They're closer to uh, the plants that might still exist in nature and are growing now. And that's how I got into it, more because I wanted that challenge. I, I probably got a bit arrogant as well at that point going, I can keep all of these things happy. Spoiler alert, I couldn't <laughs> over the long period of time. But um, because of differing cares, even with some of the common house plants and me having them all in, under the same care conditions, you learn faster that it doesn't always work. <laughs> but yeah, it was a case that with these plants that were kind of classed as rare, and I have issues with the word rare anyway at the best of times, I kind of got into it because I wanted that challenge. And that was the thing for me, because I knew that these plants won't be as straightforward. People that have been on my channel for a while will also know that I have got a bit of a running joke with everybody kind of going, give me the easiest plant on the world and watch me kill it in no minutes flat. Give me one of the hardest plants in the world and watch me make it flourish. I don't do easy well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a case that I wanted to kind of get into it for the challenge and also because they truly did look quite different to me. I will follow that up really quickly to say we've I've had discussions with other plant collectors specifically about what is classed as a rare house plant because if we just take a tiny step back from our kind of passion, obsession, call it what you will, <laughs> and I've always related this to the whole kind of, it's like, Pokemon cards, you've got to collect them all. It's for the average person who's not really into tropical houseplants at the same level that we might all be. Some of these rarer plants between them won't look distinctly different straight away. Some of them do, obviously, but yeah, and they're not. If you look at some of the common house plants, the reason why they might be common house plants is because they're so spectacularly colourful or weird shapes or they do weird things. Not all the rare plants do that. So there is a bit of that to just kind of consider. But yeah, my answer, at least in, in that respect, is I got into it because I kind of liked the challenge. So next question is, what do plants as an investment mean to you? And I will preface this and say that not everybody gets into the slightly rarer houseplants as a bit of an investment. I didn't necessarily do that either. And you could probably tell by the fact that in my entire time, I don't think I've ever sold a single plant cutting yet. But... For me, I think, and there was a lot of debate during the panel of the sentimentalists and the kind of old type of botanists that do this for the passion, that do this for all of the other things, and they might spend all this money and not then sell it to make a profit. And the people that are a lot of the times doing it to make a profit. You don't have to fall into one or the other camp exclusively, but... Yeah, those are the kind of two main lines of thoughts. If you have a differing thought or do you think there's a, a third or a fourth kind of category there, do drop it down below. But for me, I am definitely in the sentimental corner, basically, with this one. It's, yes, I will spend a bit of money. Yes, there is a running joke with a lot of my plants. I think when I got my first Monstera Albo, before it even became as big as it became, 
I was joking with kind of friends and family that I'm just like, that's my kaching money there. Every single cutting that I take from that is worth X. <laughs> I never did. But yeah, there is that kind of notion. But I think for me, as it's progressed and as I've had my collection for a longer period of time, I think there is a bit of that kind of caretaking of some of these plants that might not be around for a very long period of time. I don't know if this still holds true, but I think the philodendron golden sword, or the philodendron hastatum, is really quite low in nature at the moment. There is quite a few of these plants that are getting propagated and sold in private collections through growers and all these things. So there's probably more of it, I would hazard a guess, in private collections that maybe there is in nature at the moment. And that does mean a lot of things and that is a much deeper subject to unpack. However, I do still think that we do all kind of carry a weight of care for some of these plants. So don't get me wrong, I don't mean that anybody should be overly stressed and kind of worry themselves into the ground to try and keep all the plants happy as long as you're trying your best and you're keeping these plants happy, whether it is to sell them and make a profit or to just have them in your collection. Just, we are caretakers for these things. They are living beings at the end of the day. So trying to keep them happy would be my kind of thing for getting into some of these rarer plants. There was an interesting point, I think that was made by Jacob at this point, so it depends on what you might class as rare, and that is different to different individuals. But there is a question that is coming up in a bit for that one, and we can dive into it a bit more. But yeah, that would be my opinion as to what kind of got me into those kind of rarer plants and what does it mean for me for these investment plants. This is an interesting one, and uh, the next question is, do you think the house plant or the rare house plant bubble has burst? I know this might not be a question that everybody's comfortable with or even wants to answer, but in my line of work, what I do for a living is I run my own web design company and digital marketing company, and I'm used to seeing stats that are coming out from Google all the time. I'm not going to bore you with the very, very specific numbers, but yes, essentially the market doubled and sometimes even quadrupled in terms of people actually searching for some of these rarer plants in the middle of the pandemic. So there was definitely a bubble that happened there. Any one of us who was trying to buy any form of plant in the middle of the pandemic will know how expensive things got and it got ridiculous and it was always going to burst. Do I think it has burst? Yes. And looking at some of the stats that I can see from Google, in terms of when people are searching, we are kind of almost back down now to the kind of search volume of people searching generally online for these plants now as we did pre-pandemic. So the, the volume is still high because obviously remember if I was maybe to compare how many people were searching for some of these rarer plants or these less known plants six years ago, even in comparison to pre-pandemic, that would have been higher, obviously, pre-pandemic, and it's still relatively high. So people have still got some awareness, people are still interested in these plants. But what do you think, and this is more of a, in your local area, what you're experiencing where you are, do you think the bubble was burst? Do you think that there's more plants that are becoming available in the market, maybe for cheaper than what they were? Are the prices still staying quite high? Is there still low availability? Do let everybody know down below. I, I think people will be quite interesting to see how things might be different in different places. In the UK, it definitely has burst, I think, in my experience. And based on what the other panelists were all kind of saying, I think we all were in agreement with that one. So the next question was meant as a nice, simple, happy, cheery question to kind of lift from like some of the heavier questions. I think this for me was probably one of the more controversial questions on the panel. And it is, what is the best and the worst plant that you have purchased in terms of investment? And if you aren't doing this as an investment, just maybe answer 
which one was your best plant and for what reason and your worst plant for what reason. So I will kind of go down the investment route, even though, as I said, I've never sold any of these plants. And this is the one that I think people might get a bit upset with each other, basically. Be, try to be respectful. And I think even my answer might surprise some people. So for me, my best plant, and it might not come as a surprise, would be my Philodendron Nesmeral Dense. I got it for a good price. It was a bit on auction on eBay. And I probably went a bit higher than I wanted to go on it. It was still very, very, very low treble digits, but it was a relatively mature leaf and it was already two leaves, I think. And it was already rooted. So I think it was already rooted and I didn't have to root it. I can't remember. Um, but there wasn't very much of it at all. And it wasn't even a plant that I was particularly keen on getting, but I'm just like, ooh, got swept into the, <laughs> this is why I don't do auctions. By now is, is the thing for me on eBay. Like, <laughs> otherwise you fall down a hole and you end up paying a lot more than you would have bought it from somebody else as a buy now. <laughs> but that's just my, that's just my two cents there. Um, but yeah, with this one, it was, that's definitely the best one because, and uh, I'm going to be really transparent with you all and just kind of say, it might not be the most expensive, quote unquote, rare plant that you can find on the market at the moment, but there's a lot of people that have offered me a lot of money for even a single leaf cutting because I think one of my largest leaves at the moment is about three feet long. So, yeah. So... Yeah, it can size up quite quickly. My one has sized up. And I think that was the other point that I made during the panel, and I'm making it here again. It's sometimes not always about the plant, but it might be about the maturity of the plant as well. But more on that in a bit, I think. Worst plant <laughs> as an investment. Uh, and I think I would probably give this as one of the worst plants in terms of generally owning it, the Philodendron lupinum. And I don't know how many people have got it and might agree with me or might disagree with me in my experience. And I will always say this has been my experience in my care. Almost no growth at all. Two, nearly three years later, basically. It's been so, so slow. And I know everybody got really enamored with this plant for its mature form. But the only thing that you could find on the market was the immature form. And I know everybody got really hyped up and kind of going, oh, look, it can transition from this into this. And isn't it amazing? I don't think I've seen anybody who's actually ever got it to a mature form. And based on my experiences with how, how painfully slow it is to grow, and it just looks a bit like a fancy cutting from a Mykins. Yeah, I think for me that was... The one that I, if I, knowing what I know now, like I do with my review series, would I ever repurchase it? No. And I would tell myself, don't bother because it's a waste of money. Buy something else that will bring you a bit more joy. As I said, I've not sold any of these plants and I don't think I'm ever going to. I have gifted different cuttings to different people and it's more of a comic thing for me. So I got some amazing plants gifted to me from other collectors, which I was over the moon and very appreciative of. But I do the same thing. I kind of pass on that good karma to other people who might be struggling financially or might want something and uh, they can't definitely can't afford it. But it's it's a big thing for them. I will, if I can, either give them a cutting or give them a rooted cutting of a plant that I have. But yeah, that that would be my answer for that question. The next question is, what does the word rare mean to you? And there was a lot of people that kind of in the audience and on the panel that don't particularly like the word rare. I agree, but we don't really, this is the thing as well, like there's no consensus of a better word for it. Cheryl did mention maybe something called like a unicorn plant, possibly, but that to me almost gives it a level of, so in my head, the kind of classification that I would ever have for some of these words would be kind of common or easy to find plants, then maybe, and again, I think it's similar to kind of the way that um, other YouTubers might consider this as well. So common, maybe uncommon, then I'd go for rare, and then I'd maybe think unicorn, which is kind of the, the hardest ones to get, basically the most expensive ones, the ones that aren't readily available on the market, all of these things. I think and I think I said this as well at the panel, for me, something like a rare plant 
is relevant to the person rather than the the group as a whole, if that makes sense. So I'll give you the example that I gave on the panel as well. I have got um, a plant which I think is, I'm not going to even try, I think it's Pistachia lentissimus. I'm probably getting it wrong. I will put the name at the top there. And this is the mastic tree plant. And I'm going somewhere with this, stay with me. This plant, for me, with Greek background, and I think it also applies to a lot of the Arabic countries, this is a plant that you get resin from. It crystallizes in terms of the resin. It's then kind of ground up into a powder and used in a lot of desserts. I don't think it's meant for cooking. I think it's more desserts. Mastic itself, I think, way back when was the original chewing gum. People would take this resin and it does have that chewing gum texture. It's very almost floral, the, the resin itself. It, it's not a particularly interesting plant. They get quite large. They've got gnarly like branches and the leaves are quite small. It looks kind of almost a bit like an olive tree. I think I have done a video on the mastic plant. I can't remember if I did it. This is very beginnings of YouTube channels and all these things. I think it was on YouTube and it wasn't on Instagram. If it is on here, I will try to link it at the top there so you can see. Please don't judge. The video is very, very old. So I've hopefully come a long way in terms of editing and filming since then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the point I'm trying to make with this is that has got a very, the mastic plant has got a very fond place in my heart and a lot of the other Greeks and Arabs kind of childhoods as well because it's used a lot of the times if you ever had a baklava or anything like that and there's a flavor maybe that you can't pinpoint as to what it is a lot of the times it's mastic and it's just because you don't have that cultural context to kind of go oh it's obviously that because it's a very obvious flavor but for somebody who's never had it before or doesn't even know that it's a thing you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell now because there's such cultural background to that when i did tell some of my greek friends who are really not into plants that much that I found a mastic plant in the UK. It's very juvenile. There's, I'm nowhere near, maybe in 30 or 40 years, if I can still keep it alive, I might get some resin from it. This is another thing as well, that this is, even in nature, it's becoming a bit more of a rare plant because it only grows in very specific parts of the world. I think its care needs are very, very specific, which is why I'm still surprised that two years later, mine is growing okay. Um, but it grows, at least I know in Greece, it grows on one of the Greek islands called Chios. I know there's a few other places, maybe in Turkey and some of the other Arabic nations um, where it can grow. But it's only pockets of the world that's like that, which makes it a very, very expensive. The actual resin is very, very expensive. Even worse so because a lot of the places where it's growing are very dry and arid a lot of the times. They do get caught in bushfires. So there was a point in Greece recently, a few years back, where I think half or a third of the entire tree population that they had on the island that was generating this resin. Again, remember, this is the only place in Greece that we can get this from, burnt down. And it, as I said, it takes 20, 30 years to get them to the point where they can produce resin again. That resource, that resin was very expensive to begin with. It's ridiculously expensive now. So for then, um, I have got a point, I'm getting to it. I do apologize, you know me if you've been here for a while with my tangents. Coming back to that kind of what is considered rare, for my Greek friends, or possibly some of my Greek followers, that would be a rare plant because for them it's a rare plant and they know what it means. So it's very unique, I think, to the individual, it's also to their conditions and their, their kind of situation. So for instance, and I'll bring you another example, my Sephora prostrata, the little baby plant, grows like a weed in New Zealand. And I actually did have an amazing uh, subscriber, or follower, or viewer who made that comment. And it was just, I was really surprised. This grows like a weed everywhere here. And it's kind of almost a bit of a rare plant because you can't get it that easily in the UK. It's not, it's a bit more of an uncommon plant, but that's what I'm saying. It depends on the individual and where they are and possibly the stage of their lives as well. Because when it comes to pricing some of these rare plants as well, depending on how much money you've got to spend, something that's a hundred great British pounds or a hundred dollars might be rare for you because that's expensive within your budget, basically. But again, again, looking at price rather than the rarity of the plant or the rarity that it is in 
nature. But for somebody who's got a lot of disposable income, they might not. They might have the same reaction that you've had for a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars to something that's a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand pounds or a hundred thousand dollars. So it, it's very dependent, I think, as to the individual. So those were all the questions that we had as a panel that were structured and they were asked to us. We did have some audience questions, so I thought I'd bring those in as well for a bit of fun. So the first audience question,、uh, we all struggled a lot to hear the audience member because they were right at the back, and the microphones weren't great on that day. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> from what I remember from that question, it was if you've got a really specific plant and it needs really specific care conditions, is that still considered a rare plant? Should those plants still be sold to members of the public? And it was a sticky. Question and a sticky answer from all of us, actually. So I'll give you kind of my thoughts. I'd be really interested to hear yours. With this question, I think it is highly dependent again on the situation because should open market things are going to come and they're going to be available to everybody. Should everybody be buying plants that have got very very specific needs? And spending a lot of money on them, and then not being able to provide the needs, or not doing any research—that's a stickier subject as well. And me and a lot of other people who have had big collections for a while, we always say the same thing. And it's, we don't always follow our own instructions with this one. Is if you can, best case scenario is do a few weeks of research on a plant that you really, really want to get. See how other people are experiencing it. I do have my plant review series, which I'm hoping is going to become a bit of a repository of information for that as well. But with that, if you do your research, and as I said, not all of us do this, even though we say that we should do this. But if you do that and you go into it knowingly, hopefully you can catch it before. So let me give you an example. If you're getting a plant that has very, very specific conditions that you know, whatever you do, you're never going to be able to replicate those conditions, and the likelihood is that plant is going to struggle or even potentially die. You might make that decision at that point to just kind of say, "I bow out. I don't want to do it. Let somebody else have it." And especially if it's a lot of money, I don't want to waste that money necessarily. Not everybody will have that same thought. Some of it might find it as a challenge and try to do it, and that's fine. But you're going into it with eyes open. The question that then morphed into what we were talking about in the panel is: there are certain plants, and Jacob did kind of mention this as well. There are certain plants that he was saying are kind of true, true rare plants that are very, very rare to come out in the market. They're very rare in nature as well. They they have predominantly come from. Uh, botanical centres selling off some of these plants to very very serious collectors is a whole bunch of money. They're not particularly impressive. He was saying, and I've seen plants like this as well. He's like, if I put it on the website and I put it for anything more than say twenty or thirty or fifty Great British pounds, when the plant might be worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, people still probably wouldn't buy it because it's not an exciting plant and nobody's talking about it. So it is very relevant in that respect. But again, in terms of the care, do I think you should or shouldn't buy it? That's up to you to make that decision. But if you're going to buy something that's got very, very specific needs and it's going to be a lot of money to buy, and there might not be that many of it in nature, if you are going to be doing it, even if you like the challenge, do at least try to replicate those conditions for that specific plant. And whatever that might mean, by the way, for this one, if it means that you've got everything set up, I've got everything set up. That needs similar care levels and the, the the conditions are very similar in this room. Would I bring something in here that needs exceptionally dry, arid, bright, bright light conditions? No, because I would then be risking all my other plants to keep that one plant happy. If I had a space that I could give that plant that exact condition. And I can see from other people that have cared for it, that's what it needs. Yes, I probably would do this, but I'd be really interested to see what you think with this specific question. The second audience question was quite an interesting one. 
do we feel like we need to keep the sanctity of the word rare going? And this was interesting because actually nearly all three of the panelists, we all kind of more or less agreed with each other with this one. Probably not. And all of us slightly twitched at the word rare at the best of times. And as I mentioned earlier on, it could be that discussion of unicorn plants. Do we find another way to describe it? Because the word rare has a lot of connotations with it. It might also be used sometimes to generate hype. There are a lot of instances where people keep calling a plant rare, and the only reason why it's rare is because the resellers or the the growers might be keeping it back so it doesn't flood the market, even though they've got loads of it. I am not going to name names or specific plants for this one, but the people that know probably know. It is a tricky one to answer this one as well. Do we need certain ways of being able to classify plants, not just in terms of price, but in order to classify the care needs? I'd say probably yes. Are we there yet with any kind of wording? I don't think we are, but let me give you a more specific example so I'm not kind of talking just rubbish here. If you're just starting off in your plant journey, the word rare currently as it stands might make you pause slightly and say, I don't think I know enough about plants. Do I want to go down this route? Because if this is a rare plant, it might be difficult. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That could be a good thing until you're kind of ready to care for that plant, not only for the well-being of that plant, especially if it's rare in nature as well, but also for your own sanity. There are some of these things that if it's, sometimes if it's not classed as rare and you don't have that kind of notion already in your head, but you spend a lot of money on it, is that going to stress you out? And even though you're doing the best that you can do, you probably just don't have the experience or the knowledge just yet. You probably will get there to keep it happy. So, I mean, at the core of it, a lot of people that do have plants and they're not just doing it to flip the plants and cut the plants and make a profit, that's an entirely different set of people, generally want to keep their plants happy. Really, as I said earlier on, it's a living thing. I kind of want to keep it happy. So I don't think that the word rare has any real sanctity to a lot of us. Do we need some form of classification system? In my opinion, yes, but something that maybe works a bit better. And the last couple of questions, and I will split them up as well, because these are... We, we finished with a bang, let's say this one. These were difficult questions, and I don't think any one of us answer them wholly, uh, but when you see the questions you'll understand why they're much bigger topics, like each one of these questions could be their own video basically. So the first one of these questions is, how do you try to make sure that the local communities of these plants are coming from, for instance, in the Far East or even in Central America are getting what they are due, basically. Because a lot of the times, some of these plants that have got obscene price points with them as well, every single person that that plant passes before it gets to you makes it more expensive. So let me give you a very specific example. Something that's being sold in Indonesia might be expensive in Indonesia uh, because not a lot of people have it and there's a price cost that goes with it. If you are not buying it directly from that seller, you're probably buying it from a reseller that in your own country has maybe imported that plant. So the cost that you're going to end up paying for this plant might be two or three or four or ten times more than what the original seller in Indonesia sold it for. In terms of business, this kind of does make sense because the seller in Indonesia will charge you what they need to charge you. They will also sell the reseller they will also charge for things like phytosanitary certification, delivery costs, all of these things of preparation to get the plants to them. So that's another cost that that reseller has to then take on board. Then they need to be able to collect the plants, they need to be able to store the plants, they need to be able to grow those plants out or acclimate them within that local community if they're doing things properly and not just shipping them out because... Um, um, so there is a cost that's going to be attached to that. And obviously that reseller then also needs to make a profit on them. So that's what I'm saying. The prices can get quite different to begin with. Is there a simplistic way around that? I don't know there is. You could buy directly from 
the growers. A lot of people, though, don't necessarily realize that a lot of the times, if you're going into that, assume that you're going to get a wet stick to propagate, even if you get leaves. Because a lot of the times they might come to you and they might just be a chunk and some roots, if you're lucky, to be able to root out. You might not even get the roots, they might have rotted on the way here. So with those local sellers of these plants, there's another layer to this as well, which is also the layer of poaching. So I think the most that we can do as the people that are purchasing these plants is be aware of a lot of these things and make decisions that you are comfortable with. So for instance, one of the things that I want to start doing a bit more is actually finding conservation projects that are run by locals in these communities to conserve some of the natural plant life that is there within these kind of local areas. And I want to start donating some money to that to kind of keep that going there, hopefully to offset any kind of poaching that might happen. You can try your best not to get a poached plant, but there's no guarantee 100% you don't know necessarily. There are ways that you might be able to figure it out. And if you've got sellers that you are comfortable buying from, you might be okay with that. But it is one of those things that is a much bigger topic. Remember what I said at the very beginning of this, these could be videos in themselves. And I don't necessarily think there's a black and white answer just yet. I think this is something that we as a group are all trying to figure out as we're going along at the moment. And yeah, so that's one aspect of it as well. And it's making sure that the sellers from these local communities are getting what they're worth. But again, that could be to do with how much you're buying from it from the actual reseller or how much you're willing to pay. So say, for instance, you find a few sellers in Indonesia, some of the majority of the sellers are selling this plant, the same exact plant for, say, 500 US dollars. But there is one seller that's selling it for 50 Question that you have there is, is that poach? That's the first question. And secondly, because maybe they didn't have any costs and they just went and got it from nature and they're just going to resell it to you as well. But also, if they are a proper organization, why do they feel that they need to sell it that much cheaper than everybody else? Have that conversation with them, basically, and see. And I know you might say, oh, that's a great deal. I'm going to go for it. But question it a bit more and then see, basically, because they might just be starting off and they might not know the value of what they're doing. So making sure that they get paid what they are due, I think would be important to most people. The second question is again, another sticky one. Ah, this was, and again, the microphones weren't that great. I'm trying to remember as well as I could what these questions were. And the question was, what about biodiversity within kind of plants and the genetic diversity that might be happening with a lot of plants that are happening now within tissue culture? So this is an interesting thing, and it doesn't just apply for plants. It applies generally with any form of genetic manipulation. Heavy subjects. I'm sorry to end on a heavy note, but I thought these two last questions really got my kind of geeky brain working, just kind of going, oh, these are really cool questions. So people try to, to kind of approach this from different angles. I've got a scientific background, as some of you might know if I've been here for a while, where science will move ahead and these things will keep on happening. Do we need some kind of rules and regulations to kind of make sure that that diversity is still occurring? Probably. There's always going to be experimentation though as well. And with the negative, you do get some benefits as well. And I think they were talking about things like some of these plants might have lost some of that genetic diversity, so they are exceptionally like, super sensitive to specific pathogens or specific pests, and it causes no end of issues. But then you also need to think about the flip side of this, is sometimes when you do that, you might also get things that are super resilient to certain things as well. And there are decades, if not centuries, of humans manipulating plants in a specific way, more so in terms of food crops, because that's a huge industry in itself. 
to kind of make them pest resistant. And I've mentioned this in other videos, so there are now uh, tomato plants that might be a bit more resilient to blight. So things like that. So there is a positive thing to look at in that respect as well. It's also an easier way to kind of reduce the risks of things like poaching because that's a bit more of a controlled environment. Yes, there's going to be positives and negatives, but this is something that I think a lot of scientists are working on as well. I kind of added an extra layer to this talking about some of the ethics, some of the... Um, the colonialism as well that happens within the scientific community as well, and I touched on this on a previous video briefly as well, but it's the kind of things like naming, the the slight arrogance of a lot of the, the colonizers or even kind of people that went to scientists that went to local areas and discovered plants. Where if, if you just take a moment to step back from that and just kind of think, if that plant has been there for centuries, and I'm sure the local communities had their own names, had their own uses, had their own knowledge of that plant, what makes you any better than anybody else to say you've discovered it and I'm now going to name it this? The challenge with that is the problem with that is the norm now. And we do kind of need a unified system. Would it be interesting to start getting some of these plants renamed for or named back to what the original local name for it was. Yes, probably. I think back then when it was happening as well as a lot of them were done in Latin because it, it was agreed that that would be the universal language for plants and the classifications of them and all these things. Do I personally think that there's a bit of scope for that to get updated and a bit more renewed and become a bit more inclusive? Yes, 100%. I think, and I think a lot of people will probably agree with that, is bring back those original names, if possible, if they still exist, because they might have been lost to everybody else. But, and as long as we can all agree that that is this now, then it should be fine. And I mean, I know that it can be challenging, and I'm thinking of things that have been reclassified from Sansevierias to Dracaenas now, and we're still all calling them Sansevierias. Will it be a smooth transition? Probably not. And people, if they've got used to calling something X for a very long time, they might keep calling it that for a long period of time. But then at least it is there, and eventually society and the community as a whole will catch up and hopefully start naming these things. The same thing that the local communities might have said. But as I said, these might all be controversial topics for one reason or another. But Hopefully this has been entertaining for you and hopefully there's been loads of discussion down below. I don't know, as I said, hopefully I'll be able to do this as a premiere. If not, this might just be a regular video and you can all just leave comments down below. But yes, I won't kind of hold you anymore. This has been a relatively long video anyway. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.